let's open up our Bibles, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1. And our passage this morning is 17 through 27. It says here, And David lamented with the lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son. And he said, It should be taught to the people of Judah, behold, it is written in the book of Jashar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exalt. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the, seal, the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am in distress for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. So our passage today is written in the form of a lament, and it says that clearly in verse 17 that this is uh, that David lamented with the lamentation over Saul. Uh, lament basically is a um, that's when someone physically expresses their their grief by wailing, by moaning, or weeping. It's just this uh, this extreme display of, of 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 sadness and mourning, and a lamentation is basically a written expression of that mourning. Uh, we have several uh, examples of lamentations in the Bible. The easiest one is uh, the Book of Lamentations, right? So that's that is a a, a book filled with lament because of Israel's sin and God's discipline upon the nation. Uh, but there's also uh, lamentations in Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, uh, obviously here in our chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 1. And then we find several psalms that are, uh, that are written in forms of lamentations. So if a lamentation is an expression of mourning, that's the way we need to uh, take this passage. It is a grieving passage. It's not an upbeat passage, uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of good things that we can gather from this expression of mourning from David. Um, with David, there's a good reason for him to lament here. Uh, the man he looked up to the most and also the man that he loved the most are both dead. Those were two separate men. The man he looked up to the most was Saul. He, king Saul, that was his king. That was his mentor, so to speak. Um, even when... even. Because our, even though Saul treated him harshly, David still loved him and looked up to him as a mentor. And then, obviously, with Jonathan and the relationship he had, that was, um, that was his closest brother in the faith, so to speak. And so both of these men are dead on the same day. And we see that because God had swiftly brought his judgment on Saul. And Jonathan was a part of that. Uh, obviously, Jonathan had he 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 had some blame in the situation, but mainly this was about Saul and his disobedience. But we see uh, God's judgment being brought on Saul, Jonathan, and here it includes the whole nation of Israel. And for David, it's just too much to bear. Uh, it, it's just too much bad news in one moment. And as I look at that situation, I I, I often. Uh, I, I think about how often I've been there, and I know you've been there as well. In, in fact, 
we, we can put ourselves in David's shoes. Maybe your mentor and your close brother has not died, but uh, there has been someone close to you that has died or many people close to you that have died that have pretty much crushed you. That moment or the loss of that life has crushed you. You've never been the same ever since. It's a loss that is so deep that it hurts to even live. Um, it's, it's, it's just something that, that, that you never want to go through again, but yet, you know, one day you're going to have to, because we live in a, a world where everything is perishing the world around us and also the people around us, including ourselves. The Bible says, though outwardly we are wasting away the hope that we have in Christ is that we're being renewed day by day. Amen. I want to I want to amen the fact that we're being renewed day by day, but I don't want to amen the fact that we're perishing every single day either. That outwardly we're wasting away. The, to me, I just I just cannot amen that. But it's a fact that we all have to face that outwardly we are wasting away. So we're, we're going to go through tragic things like this. We're going to we're going to go through times of loss. And so we can empathize with David here and we can see uh, that, that this is a very, very tragic moment for him. But it's in these moments that you learn so much. So from David's lament here, uh, it, it's, it's in this moment of his loss that, that we look at this and, and we can learn so much from what David says in this passage. And basically there are three things that I want to grab out of this. There are several things that we could have, that I could have, several directions I could have went. I could have focused on David's character and how he spoke well of Saul, even though Saul hunted for his life all those years. Um, I, I could have went that direction, but I, I wanted to focus on the lament itself and what, what David was saying through his words. And as I look at the lament and break it down, I, I look at the passage and try to get my my points out of the passage, the very first thing that I notice is that David shows us in this passage that there is a time for mourning. There is a time for mourning. Now, you may hear that and say, well, that's pretty basic. And I would agree with you. That is pretty basic, but it's basic as far as understanding it. But as far as knowing it and allowing yourself to do it, it's not so basic. Because I think a lot of us have an issue with mourning at the right time or just mourning at all. So that's something that everyone needs to acknowledge and accept that there is a time for mourning. Um, his lament follows the tragic news that came from Saul's camp in, in verse 4. And this man comes, this messenger comes from Saul's camp. He's all disheveled and and, and, and he, he just looks beat up and it doesn't look good. They ask him, where are you from? He says, I'm from the camp of Saul. David is waiting for news from there. He said, what happened? And the messenger, who ends up being a, an Amalekite, tells him what happened. He says that uh, the people have fled. And then he says, many of the people have fallen and are dead. And then he ends with Saul and Jonathan are also dead. So this is the news that David gets in the first 16 chapters or verses in this chapter. And you can see as, as you read it, you can, you can kind of step into the scene and you can feel the, 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 how the bad news just hits David one after another after another. And I think last week I described it as, as, as sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow. Uh, it's just one bad thing after another. And finally, the big blow was that Saul and Jonathan are also dead. And you can see how all the hopes and dreams that David had for Saul, for Jonathan, and even Israel has basically come crashing down on him. David and Jonathan talked about the future uh, often when they met. And the last time that they were together and that they actually talked, Jonathan came to minister to David because David was down in the dumps. He was, he was just discouraged from Saul chasing after him and, and having to hide from Saul. And so Jonathan comes to encourage his brother. And in 1 Samuel 23, verse 17, this is what Jonathan tells David before they depart from one another. He tells David, you shall be king over Israel. He says, hey, don't worry. My father is not going to find you. 
you're going to live. You, sh- you will be king over Israel, Israel, and I shall be next to you. And he says, Saul, my father knows this. Deep down inside, he knows this. So you can see from chapter 23, verse 17, which were basically the last words, at least recorded words that Jonathan said to David. He says, I shall be next to you. You're going to be king and I'm going to be standing right next to you, helping you. I'm going to be your right hand man. Well, that's not coming true anymore. And that's hit David really hard. See, although this was the sovereign hand of God moving in David's life. And, and I think he recognized that. This is a, the sovereign hand of God. This is judgment on Saul. This was something that David was told would happen over and over and over again. Maybe not the specifics on how it would happen, but that Saul would be demoted or replaced with him. So looking at the situation, I think David can accept that this was the sovereign hand of God to catapult him to the throne, but yet it was still extremely painful to endure. How many of us have been there? That's a humbling place to be because if if we look at scripture and we see God as sovereign and and we understand what that means, and yet we're suffering, and yet we're hurting, we have to acknowledge that one way or another, God knows about this, and he's allowing us to go through it. And that's hard to accept. Because in our, in our minds, in our carnal minds, our, we, we think, well, this is not fair. Why would God let me go through this? Why would I hurt so bad from it? You know, I don't ever know the answers to those questions. Those are questions that we'll find out on the other side of heaven. But, but here I can say it's for his glory and our good in general. But in those times, we learn to cling to him. We learn to trust in him. And then we also learn a little bit about ourselves. It's through those times that the Lord searches our hearts. And all the impurities that are in our hearts come to surface. So, yes, this is a sovereign hand of God in David's life. Catapulting him to the throne. This is God's promise fulfilled David's going to be king he never imagined it'd be like this but he is going to be the king of Israel and yet this is the most difficult time of his life and if you look back at what just happened to David days ago he's coming from basically an event where his wife and his kids were kidnapped and he had to go back and rescue them He's gotten a little bit of rest, two days. This messenger comes in with this news that Israel's dead, or the nation of Israel, everyone has fled. Uh, Some have fallen, many are dead, and Saul and Jonathan are also dead. Talk about a bad week. So he's already vulnerable, and when he hears the news, it just crushes him. He rips his clothes and he begins to mourn. This is what the sovereign hand of God looks like sometimes. It's it's not pretty. We don't understand it. But yet, there's something peaceful about it. that That God's hand is over it. See, maybe in the future, David would look back and appreciate God's grace at work in this moment. But right now, he's in pain. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay because there is a time to mourn. See, Christians put extreme pressure on themselves to not mourn when they are supposed to be mourning. We've always been told since we were a little kid, we've been told, don't cry. We've been told, be tough. And and all those things may have been good advice for us at the time, There's more that goes into it than just not showing emotion. See, we think we're always supposed to be happy and singing and clapping our hands, even when something tragic happens. We think that we have failed God or that we have fallen back in faith or 
or anything like that. We, we, we tend to think those things, that if we're not happy and singing and clapping uh, like the apostles are in the Bible, then we've shrunk back in faith and, and we're, not, we're not worthy of anything. The fact is, the Bible does tell us to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Bible does tell us that. That's James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And I think when we read passages like that, we get confused about how we're supposed to respond to tragic news. We're like, oh, I'm supposed to count it as a complete joy. So what does that mean? Am I supposed to be clapping when I hear that someone close to me is dying or that someone has died or I've lost this loved one or someone close to me is sick? Am I supposed to just be happy about it? The answer to that question is no, you're not. You're not because there is a time for mourning. Listen, it is a testing of your faith. And that's what James is saying here. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a test that was not difficult. The testing of our faith is an, is, is, is an excruciating process. And that's something that we have to realize. It is a process that God takes us through. There's a starting point and then there's an ending point. So just because you start off mourning doesn't mean you're going to end that way. But you got to start somewhere. If it's a process, then that means that us mourning and grieving is a part of that process. And we are to count it all joy, not that something tragic has happened. We're not wired that way. When something tragic happens to us, we're wired to respond to it with grieving. So we're not to count it all joy that our that, we're, that this tragic event has happened, but rather we are to count it all joy that our mourning will resort in steadfastness and steadfastness into spiritual growth. That, that's where the joy comes in. The joy comes in the process. I know that I'm at this starting point and it's low. I, I'm in the uh, the, the, the shadow of death right now, so to speak, as, as David said in Psalm 23. I'm in this deep, dark valley. That's my starting point. But my joy comes from knowing that God has me all the way through. My joy comes from knowing that through this process, I will grow. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it out of this valley. God's going to help me all the way through. Even if I have to go through this valley for the rest of my life. My Lord is faithful to me. Even though I am not faithful to him. That's what we are supposed to count as all joy. And all of this by the way is happening. By the gracious hand of God. So if you ask me is it okay to mourn. I would say yes. It is okay to mourn. This was a great loss for the nation of Israel and for David personally. This was an appropriate time for the expression of both sorrow and reflection. The Bible tells us that there is a time to mourn. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. For everything there is a season. A time for every matter under, the, under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to be healed. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep 
and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Amen. That is, that is beautiful. In every season, there's a time. So God is saying, yeah, there's a time to mourn. That's your starting point. But I'm going to see you through the process. See, when we think about this, we must remember that even Jesus wept. That's humbling to think about. The world was made through him and for him, and yet at the loss of his friend, he wept. He who was perfect in every way wept. Let that be a reminder to us all. We must learn to rejoice when there's, when there's a time of rejoicing, and we must learn to weep when there's a time for weeping. Even the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 15, when it comes to our fellowship and love for one another, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Yeah, there's a time to mourn. But secondly, his passage or this passage also tells us that there is a reason to mourn. He helps us to see that. Again, Israel had just suffered a great loss to the Philistines. Their army was decimated. Their people were dead and scattered. Uh, the, the heads of the royal family had perished. It was just sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow for David. But what bothered him the most was that he lost two close friends. That he lost Saul and Jonathan. And when you look at this lament, it begins with David requesting that it be written down in the book of Jashar. And I thought it was interesting, Jashar, the book of Jashar is, is mentioned a couple of times in the Old Testament. And basically, theologians believe that it's a lost book of poetry that was dedicated, dedicated to pious heroes of the Old Testament. So this book would have been a, a record book, so to speak. This book would have been something that the Israelites would have gone back to and, and read at maybe a gathering or, or when they were just together. This was a tragedy they would not want to relive, but one they would always want to remember. It's like um, equating it to the events of September 11th. They look around, there are some people who were born after that. In here. And you mentioned September 11th and you're like, well, I, I, I don't quite remember. I know it was a tragedy, but I don't quite remember it. You go back and you look at documentaries about it. You're reminded about how tragic that event was. It's like, oh, yeah. Certainly don't want to relive that, but I do want to remember that. See, this lamentation follows the structure of a of a joint eulogy. To eulogize someone is to talk good about them, talk about the blessings they were in their life. We eulogize someone at a funeral. And so David, what he does here, he lists um, several blessings or good things about Saul and Jonathan's life. Look at verse 22. First he says, or first he praises them for their bravery. In verse 22, he says, from the blood of the slain and from the fat of the mighty, the bowl of, jo the bowl of Jonathan turned not back and the sword of Saul returned not empty. He said they were brave men. And mind you, we know Saul's past. We know that when he went to the median of Endor, that, that he was afraid of the Philistine army. He was afraid of their number, afraid of their power, and he was trying to find some way to win the battle. So he went on with the battle. We may want to look at that event and say, well, then that's not brave. No, that is brave. Even though he was afraid, he faced 
that battle, went into battle, and he lost his life in that battle. There are other times where he wasn't so brave, like with Goliath. But Jonathan focuses, or excuse me, David focuses on the good. And he says these two men, in this lament, he says these two men were brave men. He goes on, not only verse 22, but uh, look at the very next verse, verse 23. He says, Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. He's praying, he's praising them for their loyalty to one another. Jonathan's loyalty to his father cost him his life. There's reason for praise for that. In a world where people are not as loyal as we should be, David says, no, they were devoted to one another. Verse 24, you daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. It's, it's, when you look at that passage and you compare it to how the ladies of Israel sung whenever they came in from winning their battles earlier in 1 Samuel, they sung praises to Saul and to Jonathan, or to David. They said, upon Saul, he has killed his thousands. Upon David, he has killed his ten thousands. So this, that, that was a song of praise for them. And now David is saying, just like you sang songs of praise for Saul, now, now you need to weep over Saul. Why? Because of his battles and his victories in battle, you've had a good life from a monetary standpoint. He has, as a king, he has provided for you. And he also, at the very end, praises them or he praises Jonathan for his friendship. Look at verse 25. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. Then he goes on to this very personal um, part of, of his lament for Jonathan. Verse 26. He says, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now it's unfortunate that I have to stop here and explain this because in no way would this have been understood this way at any other time period. But here we have people who look at this verse and they say, you see, they were in a homosexual relationship. We've addressed this already, that scripture would have called it out. Because later in 2 Samuel, when, um, when David sins with Bathsheba, Scripture calls it out as sin. See, Scripture doesn't hide sin. It shows it. It exposes it. And in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, homosexuality is seen as the same thing. It's repulsive to the Lord. So there is no way that this passage here is pointing to a homosexual relationship. Rather, I think for the people who see it that way, they fail to acknowledge the fact of what true Christian uh, relationship is to be. What true fellowship really is between two men or, or two women and we also have to acknowledge that this was a different time. Things were different between husband and wives then. Uh, uh, you know, for David, he had two wives. And there are theologians who think that these women that he's talking about, he's saying to Jonathan, my closeness to, my closeness to you was, was closer than I am to the two women that I'm married to. Meaning, we went to battle together. 
We cried together. We bled together. We saw others die around us together. I talked to men who have been at war and the relationship that they formed with those that they fought with. They said it's unlike anybody else that they ever met in their life. They were men remember these men for the rest of their lives. And if they see them 50 years later, it's like they never left each other. It's this closeness that they have. This bond that they have, that they've been through hell together and they made it out. That's what David is saying here. This was his brother in the faith. This has nothing to do with homosexuality. But see, what we see in this lament is a reoccurring theme. And it's emphasized. It's it's spoken three times. David says, how the mighty have fallen. Well, the mighty here is representative of, uh, it's, it's representation of Saul and Jonathan. They were the pillars of the nation. And so when David is referring to Saul and Jonathan, he calls them the mighty. How the mighty have fallen. Now David's shock, you can see it in this passage, of how they fell Well, that's found in verse 25. It's like he can't believe it. Uh, Saul and Jonathan were such great warriors that he just cannot believe that they fell in the midst of the battle. Because he says in verse 25, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. See, the loss of the battle to the Philistines and the loss of the lives of Saul and Jonathan, those things were extremely humbling Not only to David, but to everyone. It's almost as if they never thought that Saul and Jonathan would die that way. It's almost as if they thought, well, you know, they may die. We all know that people die, but they're going to die a different way. We get caught up in that, too, with our loved ones. We're thinking, oh, we just never think about it. We know in the back of our minds people perish, but it's like we don't think about it. And David's looking at this situation and he's like, how the mighty have fallen. I can't believe it. I can't believe that Jonathan and Saul have died in this battle with the Philistines. When we look at when Israel loses a battle in the Old Testament, it was because the Lord had given them into the hands of their enemy as discipline for something. And in fact, this Moment in time right here, we can see that. We know that the Lord is disciplining Israel here. Um, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 10 talks about this event. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verses 13 and 14. Listen to this. This is the explanation as to why Saul died and why things happened the way they happened here in our passage. It says, so Saul died for his breach of faith. He died for his breach of faith. Uh, He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. That's official biblical record of why this happened. That's scripture interpreting scripture. It's a beautiful thing. There's no arguing that. I love that. That makes my job easy. You can argue with me all you want, but I just show you scripture and say, here you go. Argue with God. See, we need to understand this, that first of all, this is God's discipline on the nation, but not all tragedy comes to us as discipline for our sin specifically, but it does come to us by the sovereign hand of God. There's no escaping that. If God did not want you to go through it, he would have prevented it. You are going through it because God is allowing it. See, the impact of this event is even understood by the secular world. That's a a popular saying, isn't it? 
Oh, how the, how the mighty have fallen. Even today, how the mighty have fallen. How the mighty have fallen. We say that when someone is being humbled by their circumstance. Uh, when a rich man loses his riches, how the mighty have fallen. Especially if someone is very prideful when they are mighty. They say, oh, he deserved it. Or when a strong man loses his strength, how the mighty have fallen. Or a beautiful woman loses her beauty, how the mighty have fallen. See, when David said it, he didn't mean it that way. When David said it, it was a statement of grief. Of disbelief, of pain, of crying out to the Lord, how the mighty have fallen. Couldn't believe it that they fell in battle. Well, what does that teach us? Well, when bad or tragic things happen to us, they are, or it's a, an appropriate reason to mourn. There's reason for David to mourn here, and, and there's good reason for it. And he's explained everything as we go down through this lamentation. See, God not only gave us the ability to mourn, I'd like to go even further than that. God created us with the necessity to mourn. If you're a big, strong guy and you pride yourself in the fact that you don't ever mourn, there's something you need to repent from. If you're a little small woman and you, you still say, I don't mourn for anything, there's something you need to repent from. There's a, an inner pride issue that you have. Because God created us with the necessity to mourn, not just to cry, not just to mourn, but to cry out to him. That's why we need to mourn. James comes through with another great verse. Uh, James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now that passage is speaking about our sin and how we should weep over our sin. But that can be applied across the board. When we are mourning, we need to humble ourselves. Before the Lord and he will exalt us. See there's a dichotomy between generations and genders and cultures when it comes to the expression of grief. We all learn different things. And there are two main camps. There are the criers and then there are the never criers. Right? What, what camp do you fall into? The criers are the never criers. If, if I'm being honest, I'm in, in the never criers. I try to never cry, right? But when the Lord breaks me, for, for however much he breaks me, I am in the criers section. I move from the never criers to the criers. See, we need to be careful about crying too much. And I say crying, I mean mourning. But we need to be careful about crying too much. And we need to be careful about never crying. Because tears can be weaponized. If we cry too much, that means we cry for everything to get what we want. Right? To get what we want, we cry as, as, as kids, as babies. We learn that from the very beginning. Oh, if I cry, just to shut me up, they're going to give me what I want. Here you go. Great. I'm all good now. So they can be weaponized. But on the other side, it could be a matter of pride. I'm not going to cry. You're not going to make me cry. I'm not going to show you that I'm weak. I'm not going to show you that you've affected me in this way. I'm not going to let you see me this like this. So either way, we need to be careful about weaponizing or mourning or make it in a matter of pride. In other words, 
the reason for mourning is not for everything and it's not for nothing. But rather, we must be sensitive to, the, to God's work in our tragedy. Our mourning is at the mercy of God's sovereign hand and it should always result in us crying out and depending more on him. That's what mourning is about. It's not about us not getting our way and then we cry over our own situation and think, oh, that was a good cry. I needed that. And it's not about us bragging to everybody and, and, and putting up this persona that you're a tough guy when really inside you're not. You just don't want to express it. In fact, it's really not about us, but it's about us coming to the throne of grace. It's about us coming to our Father when we need Him. It's about us humbling ourselves before the Lord and saying, I need you. I need you right now. I need you more than ever. All these sinful thoughts I have, all these, the, the sinful behavior I'm going through because I'm mourning, I don't know what to do. I need you. How can I glorify you in this? Because right now my flesh does not want to glorify you. I, I, I do not want to praise you. I do not want to follow you. Lord, help me. I'm reminded of Christ again. While, while Jesus comp contemplated and prayed concerning his crucifixion, in his moment of anguish, he cried out to his father, not my will, but yours be done. I think that's a sobering moment to teach us that there is a reason to mourn. Christ was mourning over the cross. He was mourning over the sin that he would have to take. He was mourning over the wrath that he would face on our behalf. And he's like, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, but yours be done. Let that be a sobering moment to teach us that there is a reason and a purpose for mourning. When we look at something that is tragic and we don't understand what's happening. I'm not saying that Christ didn't understand. He fully understood. But for us, when we don't know what's happening, we don't know why it's happening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's understand his purpose behind it. If you're his child, his purpose is not to punish you in that he is making you suffer for nothing. Rather, in your suffering, it is the beginning of a process of growth. God is going to grow you through this. So there is a purpose for our mourning. And then I want to end with this. Since there is a time for mourning and there is a reason for mourning, we need to do it a certain way. And I've been talking about it gradually as we've been going along. There is a time and a reason to mourn with hope. We must never mourn without hope. Ever. If we have Christ, we always have hope, even in the most tragic of times. See, from our passage, we have identified the time to mourn, because there is a reason to mourn. But in Christ, our mourning must never, ever, ever be without the hope of the gospel. In Christ, we are to mourn with the hope that comes from God. Listen to this out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. And when the Bible speaks about sleep, it's speaking about death. That... You may not grieve as others do who have no hope. What is Paul? Who is Paul talking about there? He's talking about those who do not know Christ. It's like, listen, 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 brothers and sisters, when someone close to you dies, it's OK to mourn. How do we know that? Well, because he says you may not grieve as others do. He didn't say you must not grieve at all. But rather, Paul says, you must not grieve as others do who have no hope. That means grieve. 
but always grieve with hope. Why? Well, he explains it. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, amen, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Amen. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead, the dead in Christ uh, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So, man, we can get down into the details of this passage and we can start arguing about the end times. I don't want to do that. I just want to focus on how this passage was written in a pastoral way to encourage God's people that when they are mourning, there is always hope. Because that's what Paul's point is here. It's not talking about who's all millennials and post millennials or anything, or pre millennials. This is, this is a pastoral plea to God's people to say that when you are mourning over tragedy, mourn a certain way. Mourn with hope. Because no matter what, what happens to you here and now, you have a life to come. And because you have faith in Christ, that life to come is greater than the life that you are living today. Therefore, it says, encourage one another with these words. When I look at the phrase that David uses, how the mighty have fallen, I see that as a depiction of humanity. And when we look at humanity, because of our sin, we see that our bodies perish day after day. And so we can see how the mighty are falling. Like every single day we are perishing. We talked about that. Our outwardly we are wasting away. But that doesn't mean that God has lost. We, as we live, we see others around us wasting away. As we live, people around us are dying. And for some people, it's just too much to take. And they're like, no, God wouldn't let this happen. God must not care or he must not be strong enough. I, I, I ask you not to go there. Remember that you, as, 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 a, as a believer, are told to mourn with hope. So the fact that people perish, the fact that we as the so-called mighty, the fact that we fall doesn't mean that God has lost. Rather, we worship a living God. And though we fall, the almighty, he never falls. He never falls. Jesus has conquered the grave. And he is seated at the right hand of God. He is interceding for us. We've told you several times already, the theme throughout 1st and 2nd Samuel is the eternal king of glory. So when we look at David, when we look at Samuel first, and then we look at Saul, we look at Jonathan, we look at David, we see all these men, just all these mighty men fall. 
But the one who does not fall is the Almighty. He is the true king. He is the true warrior. And he is our true friend. And I want to end with this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 54 through 58. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. There's that word again. Immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain.